Hence, from about 1915 through the 1920s is a period of history known as the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance is also known as the Black Literary Movement, and it's also known as the New, New Negro Movement. Um, and it was a time where blacks found a place where they belonged, where they were comfortable, where they were accepted, where they were, they took the opportunity to be able to expose their culture to the city around them. They were comfortable being able to share new ideas, to share their social philosophies, um, to share their, their philosophies through music, through theater. Black theater in the early 1900s was extremely popular, and it wasn't just what we think about with Al Jolson, where it was all, you know, just uh, minstrels. I mean, it was, it was serious theater. Um, bringing light on the social comments of the day from the black perspective. Um, so, in this place, you know, for really the first time in American history, the blacks found a place where they could grow, they could nurture, they could develop, and they could share with the country and their culture the spirit of their citizen. And for the first time, freedom began to take a physical shape in the life of the black community. Um, musically, artists you know, such as Fletcher Henderson, Duke Ellington, Johnny Hodges, uh, they composed, they performed at places called the Savoy Ball, uh, which was on 140th and Lenox Ave. You can still find it when you go to New York today, although it's not the Savoy Ballroom anymore. Uh, but that room was immortalized by the tune Stompin' at the Savoy, which was written by a black artist, but made famous by Benny Goodman, a white musician who was termed in the 30s the King of Swing. And even though Benny, being a great clarinetist, considered himself the King of Swing, he always knew the roots from which his music um, and very often have black musicians in his band. And many times, Duke Ellington would have white musicians in his band. Um, music was really one of the first true interracial activities uh, in the United States. Um, there were also places called the Cotton Club. There was a movie about it. But probably the most famous icon, uh, the most famous musical icon in Harlem was the Apollo Theater. Really, in the in the uh, in the heart of Harlem, um, the tune that Billy Strayhorn wrote for Duke Ellington, "Take the A Train," is about taking the A Train, which is the subway train, which runs through Harlem. Um, and if you ever listen to the lyrics, there are lyrics to that song, although it's been recorded instrumentally far more times than vocally. Um, it really that's that's what it talks about. It talks about taking the train. And and going to see all of this great music, great theater that was, uh, that was available at that time. The Apollo really brought the best of black and white musicians um, to the black community. And many native New Yorkers, many, many white New Yorkers began to come because they were interested in this music. They really saw something uh, in this music. Uh, Ellington, in fact, did many performances at the Apollo for all white audiences, um, which was unheard of at this point in time in our, in our country's history. Um, and most audiences were, were of mixed crowds. Um, George Gershwin, who was one of our most famous composers uh, and in, in music and in musical theater, uh, it was he who created the first all-black production of Porgy and Bess. Porgy and Bess is an opera that he wrote. Uh, and basically, if those of you who don't know what Porgy and Bess is, it is about a slave couple uh, and their trials and tribulations through the time of slavery. Um, Langston Hughes, who is a famous author and playwright, wrote a wonderful piece called The Black Nativity. Um, the Black Nativity to this day is performed every holiday season, usually in an opera or a theater. Um, I had the opportunity to see it a couple of years ago, and it, uh, it 
spins your head. Sunday at the Apollos was talent afternoon, and the Apollo Theater turned out, you know, even though it only ran up to the 30s, its effect on modern American culture, modern American culture, is endless. Um, the Apollo Theater turned out people like Barry Gordon, who um, went on to found Motown Records. for black artists, and it really is the label that propels black artists into the mainstream of American culture, of American pop culture, not only American jazz culture, but American pop culture. Um, Smokey Robinson, who is probably one of the most influential R&B and soul singers uh, in our lifetime, came out of the Apollo, uh, out of the Apollo, as did Stevie Wonder, and as did Michael Jackson. Any African American who has really laid contributions to our society have the Apollo Theater and have the Harlem Renaissance to thank. Uh, it is the one time, um, the one moment in time where I think for the very first time in American history, um, black culture was not only being tolerated, Understood, and people were asking for more. Uh, and I think that really turned the entire tide of uh, not only arts in America, but, but culture in America. Um, artistically, throughout the Harlem Renaissance, black and white musicians alike paid homage to the black culture and the troubled world traveled, celebrating its music, its theater, its art, and its literature. It was really the first two first true step in interracial equality in America. Um, and for that reason, it stands as a real beacon of our time, uh, and a very important part of our time. So, anybody have an answer to the trivia question? Categorize is the answer to the trivia question. When many blacks got to, America, got to up the Mississippi, got to Kansas City, or St. Louis, those ports were the, were the best place to ship cattle. It's where the beef industry got started. But of course, where was the beef raised? The beef was raised around Abilene, Texas. And as many freed slaves, emancipated slaves, worked for the Transcontinental Railroad, many of them also in cattle drives and went to Texas. And in Texas, they did what they do naturally, which was to sing, which was to expound on their culture. And hence, the Texas blues was born and stayed there. So that's the answer to the trivia question. How did the blues get to Texas through the cattle drives? And uh, that's about all I have to say. But I hope you really take the time to do some independent research.